Good morning and welcome to this special Good Friday service here today at Bethel. We extend a special welcome to any guests or visitors that may be with us this morning, as well as those who are connected via the live stream. May God richly bless us as we worship him together. For those visiting, my name is Paul Hollander. I'm one of the elders here in this congregation. This morning, we welcome Pastor Branches to lead us in worship, and our pre-service song is Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2. As we gather uh, to see Jesus Christ publicly portrayed through the preaching of the word, we're called to worship uh, with these words from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. Congregation in whom is your help. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And God greets us. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together the hymn, When I Survey uh, the Wondrous Cross, recognizing we're here to see the cross of Christ.
Testament, God gave his law to the people of Israel. Uh, that law held out the perfect way of life that we are called to live, and then it also explained what would happen if we disobeyed, it laid out the curses that would fall on people who uh, committed sin, not just in thought, word, and deed, but also in desire. And then it laid out blessing uh, for those who walked in obedience. Now, as Israel struggled, refused, rebelled, and did not walk in obedience, uh, there's a lot of pain, a lot of destruction, a lot of death uh, that results because of it. But throughout that pain chronicled for us in the Old Testament, there are also glimmers of a person, uh, glimmers of a person that would come, uh, someone who would suffer, but that suffering would do something wonderful. And this morning, uh, we will read Isaiah's prophecy, a prophecy, Isaiah 53, that speaks of this person, this suffering servant who would suffer greatly, but the result would be magnificent. And so we read together Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened and not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous 
and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. As we consider our sin and the need of the suffering servant, the Savior Jesus Christ, let's sing uh, the words we heard for the call to worship. Psalm 130, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you this morning uh, to praise you for who you are and to declare uh, to those around us, even to our own heart and to the world, uh, that worthy is the lamb that was slain. Father, we confess that there are many things we like to look at, that our eyes stare at and wonder and dream about. But Lord, you draw our focus to the cross of Jesus Christ, to the one place where we have hope, where we have life, where we can see genuine love, and where we can see fullness of life given freely. And so we pray, Father, uh, this morning when we remember uh, the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that through the preaching of your word, Christ will be publicly portrayed as crucified. That though we have no photos or movies of this event, but that as we humbly trust through your word, your spirit will allow us to see in our heart and mind Christ crucified for us. 
pray that in that we might have great blessing. And so we pray uh, that you will bless the preaching and that uh, the cross of Christ might speak clearly to us of our own sin, of the reality of justice and of the full extent of mercy and redemption that you offer us. And Father, we come and many of us have questions about life, struggles that we've gone through, things that we suffer under, and we wonder and we search and our gaze looks for answers. May your spirit guide us to the answer in Christ, and may your spirit guide us to a great joy in embracing the cross of Christ. We pray that our praise, our prayer, our worship might be pleasing in your eyes, that we will be here, not because we demand from you, but because we praise you for what you have done. And so, Lord, receive all that we have humbly given to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray, or we read this morning from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 23, verse 26 through 49. Luke 23, verse 26 through is the word of God. And as they led Jesus, him, away, they seized one of Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. 
We'll sing uh, in uh, response and by way of preparation the hymn called Man of Sorrows. What a name. Uh, That name is given to Jesus in uh, the reading that we did in Isaiah 53, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so we'll sing that hymn, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. focus on the crucifixion this morning through the lens of Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 and 13 and 14. Galatians 3 1 13. Galatians 3 verse 1 and then verse 13 and 14. Paul writes letter to the church in Galatia and he writes there, O foolish Galatians, Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And then we read verse 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is the word of God. Beloved brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, this morning our goal is very simple. It's uh, to both portray Jesus Christ as crucified before our eyes and uh, to be encouraged to do that repeatedly. We're living in a very visual society and there's a lot that draws uh, our attention. There's a lot of us, a lot of things we can look at. Uh, Some of us can spend hours looking at our phone, looking at different images. I'm sure many of you saw uh, this past week that um, shocking image of a shipper container, shipping container crashing into the Baltimore Bridge and causing it to collapse. I wonder how many times you looked at that image or that video. Maybe you looked at it once and you're, whoa, it's incredible. Looked at it again, began to wonder, wow, how did that happen? Looked at it again, tried to understand exactly what was going on. There's something fascinating about 
images of destruction. Social media actually will often put uh, warning labels on certain violent imagery. Um, a little note will gray out the image and will put a little note on there that say, uh, warning, uh, this is disturbing images. And it forces you to pause and to ask yourself the question, do I need to watch this? Now, I phrase that carefully because it, it's not supposed to ask you the question, do I want to watch this? There's something in our heart that, yeah, of course I want to watch this. Now, you should ask yourself the question, do I need to watch this? This is important for me to look at. We don't need to be watching every video or movie that shows death and violence and evil. We don't need to be watching it and we have to be careful when we do watch it because images can be bewitching. It's a phrase that Paul uses in Galatians 3 verse 1 and bewitching has this sense of being captivated by what you see. The Greek word there, bewitching, actually comes from this sense of evil eye, like you've been captured by an evil eye. You're held in the grip of something powerful. Maybe some of you have images that are ingrained, so ingrained in your heart and your mind, and you cannot get rid of them, but they shape how you think about yourself, how you think about relationships, how you think about uh, the world around you, your identity, your worth, how you think about how people act. Images have incredible power and they can bewitch us. They can take us captive. Well, Paul, as he's saying that, he's saying, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What visuals, what images have taken you so captive? Don't you remember what image was put before you to give you life? Galatians 3 verse 1, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now that doesn't mean that all of these Galatians, or the people in the church in Galatia, were there at the crucifixion. Paul's not saying, don't you remember when you stood at Golgotha and you saw the crucifixion? He's not saying that. He's saying, don't you remember when I came and I preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to you and I told you about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Paul makes clear that when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are holding before the people not just a philosophy or a way of life that they can think and meditate on and, and walk in, but he is holding before uh, the people an image. The image of the cross of Jesus Christ. And he does so according to God's will, not by making photos or making movies that try to help us understand what it looked like, but he did so through the preaching of the gospel, using the word of God. The word of God teaches us that the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ should be shaped not by human imagination, but by a spirit-guided imagination shaped according to the word of God. And so our goal, as I mentioned, is very simple. See Jesus Christ crucified. We long to see again, yet one more time, Jesus Christ is publicly portrayed, and then to teach us and encourage us why it's so important that in our daily life and from week to week that we keep the cross in front of us. There's actually so many different hymns that we could have sang today. One of them is Abide With Me. There's a beautiful line, Hold Thou Thy Cross Before My Closing Eyes. Unfortunately, we're not going to sing that today, um, but it's just a reminder that this is what I want to be looking at. In this visual world where there's so much that I can look at, I want to be looking at the cross of Christ. Why? What do we want to see when we're looking at the cross of Christ? Well, we're going to focus on four specific things uh, this morning. 
First, we want to just see the cross and the pain and the shame of the cross. We're going to zoom out a little bit and we're going to see the contrast among the crucified. Every gospel account speaks of criminals crucified with Christ. We're going to step back and we're going to consider what we're supposed to see there. And then through the lens of Galatians chapter 3, we'll begin to think, well, what does it mean? How does this image change us? What's happening beyond just pain and shame? We'll see the curse carried on the cross and finally the redemption given by the cross. So what do we want to see? As we portray the cross of Christ before us, we want to see before our eyes the cross that strips the person of Jesus Christ of all humanity. Because that was the goal of crucifixion, to rob a person of all of their humanity, rob a person of their humanity physically, rob a person of their humanity emotionally, and even spiritually. And if you think about what the cross was, it would be one that would come with a warning label, warning, disturbing content, viewer discretion wise advised. But the word of God says, no, I need to see this. I need to see the physical pain. That word crucified as it's given to us in the word of God holds great physical pain. Nails are driven through the wrist bones between the two bones of the lower arm. The feet are nailed to a vertical beam and Jesus, the crucified one, is suspended, both hanging by wrists, wrists, or standing on nails. And there's a physical pain where breath becomes difficult. The human body can't function normally. Every breath is belabored, and either you're pushing up on the nails so that you can gasp for a breath, or you're hanging to relax, and you can't take a breath. And so there's this alternating um, draining, physical draining of the body. Some people could last for uh, several days, Uh, It's Jesus Christ. He dies within the day. Strips a person of the body's ability to breathe, to function, for the heart to beat. But even more so, it wasn't just physically painful. There's incredible shame. It was emotionally destructive. We can read through the Gospels and see that Jesus was emotionally destroyed. We heard last week that he was completely naked as he hung on the cross, exposed to everyone. Nothing to cover him, not even his hands. He's unable to turn because he's nailed. And above him, there's a plaque that mocks him and that says, King of the Jews. It's a, it's a mockery towards Jesus and even a mockery towards Jewish people. It says, look what happens to the King of the Jews. He's mocked and he's ridiculed. People mock his ability You say you're this, why don't you prove it? His identity is mocked. He's even mocked by other criminals. Sometimes people get solidarity uh, within gangs. No, he's even mocked by other criminals. Secular psychologists have researched the power of words to tear a person down. Some of you may be familiar with the pain of destructive words like worthless or useless, or you're ugly, or you're insignificant, you're lazy, you're weak, you're a loser, you're a failure. Ah, you're so unlovable. You're so stupid, so crazy. You're so irrational, so repulsive. It robs a person of their self-worth and self-identity. And this mockery that Jesus undergoes robs him to such a point that Psalm 22 says, I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. Stripped of humanity, physically, emotionally, and then spiritually, there's a condemnation that's laid upon. It's not even in that moment, a moment where a person can say, I don't care what people do, and no, at least God loves me. No, because the Bible makes clear that to be hanged, hanged on a tree, hanged on a cross, means you're under the curse of God. 
The curse refers to that um, judgment of God that comes on the disobedient. Say that there is no place, no life for you, no place in this world for you. You don't belong. People don't think you belong, and God himself says, no, you are under a curse. Both humanity and God has turned their back on this person. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm no more than a worm. The Lord Jesus, after he rose from the dead, made it the Apostle Paul's mission to publicly portray this horrific event before the eyes of whomever would listen. That's what he did when he came to the church in Galatia. He said, here's what I want to show you. I want to show you as I tell you the word of God, Jesus Christ is publicly portrayed. I want you to see the worm that he was forced to become. How he was stripped Stripped of all humanity, physically, emotionally, spiritually, how he was cursed by God. I want you to see Jesus Christ as portrayed. And Jesus told the Apostle Paul, this is what I want you to do. This is your mission. And that is the mission of the church of Jesus Christ. To hold before the eyes. Hold before our eyes. Hold before the eyes of each other. Hold before the eyes of the world. The cross of Jesus Christ. Do you see him? Do you see Jesus Christ crucified? It may be one of those images uh, that is so abhorrent and so repulsive that you say, no, I don't want to. This is disturbing. I don't want to spend time thinking here. I want to spend more time thinking about uh, the, uh, the beauty of humanity and the creativity of humanity, uh, this violence, this destruction. I don't want to see that before my eyes. But the word of God says, no, you must. You must see Jesus Christ portrayed as crucified. Because it's through that seeing that Truth and life and freedom is brought to you by God. It's through the closing of your eyes that you become bewitched by the images given to you in this world. So see Jesus Christ is crucified. But as you see Jesus Christ is crucified, don't just focus on the one in the middle. Take a step back. Every gospel makes this clear, and it is significant that Jesus is not the only crucified one. There are two others that are crucified with him. Two robbers, two criminals crucified with him. One on the right, one on the left. Jesus is in the middle. And so as you see Jesus crucified, you take a step back and you see the three crosses and three crucifixions. These criminals are crucified. We don't know what their specific crime was. It's very possible it was some violent robbery, some insurrection. But as you see uh, these three crucified, there's a conversation happening up there. One of the criminals, he joins in mocking Jesus. Actually, both of the criminals join in mocking Jesus initially. We know the words of the one. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself. In other words, you say this is who you are. You're a failure unless you prove it. Oh, you're not going to prove it. (laughs) What a failure. Both criminals mock him. But then there's a moment, and we're not told when that moment is. The Gospel of Luke records it for us, where the other criminal turns to the fellow robber and he says, And he speaks over the middle. He speaks to the other side. He speaks to Jesus, or he speaks to the other criminal over Jesus. He says, do you not fear God since you are under the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Those words from that robber help us understand what we're to see. As we see those three crosses and as we see Jesus Christ being crucified, what we're called to see is that with these criminals, there is, there are those who deserve this judgment. 
The robbers, these criminals, they are receiving justice. They deserve to be there. The government has sentenced them and has brought them to execution. God's law condemns them. They are under the curse of God. And one of the robbers says, you know what? I've come to realize that my life, my thoughts, my words, my deeds, my desires, it brings me to this point and this is where I deserve to be. And so as you see these three crosses on the on the outside, on the right and the left of, the, of Jesus in the middle, you see two people who deserve to be there. But in the middle, there's Jesus Christ. And the emphasis throughout the Gospels couldn't be clear. He doesn't deserve to be there. He doesn't deserve to be there. Nobody could come up with a good reason for why he should be there. Even when they arrested him and brought him into court, the very people who arrested him had to find some false witnesses to accuse him. They had to drum up some charges because they could find nothing. Pilate, the uh, Pilate, the judge, the earthly judge, he spends some time with Jesus. He speaks to Jesus. He comes to a very clear conclusion. He's innocent. There's no guilt in him. Even while he's hanging there, one of the Roman centurions says, truly, this man was innocent. And so as you see Jesus Christ publicly portrayed and as you see the three crosses, you see a a curse that falls on uh, the two criminals that they justly deserve. But in the middle, there's this perplexing problem. Here is a man who is innocent and yet all of humanity has come to place him onto the cross and God himself has put him under a curse. This is unique. Perfect innocence is unique in all the world. There's a famous uh, quote by um, Berea, who was a secret police chief in Joseph Stalin's regime, and he famously said, show me the man and I'll find you the crime. In other words, he said, look, it doesn't matter. Point somebody out. I can find something that they've done. I can find a reason they deserve to be brought to trial. And as you're sitting there, as you think about your thoughts and your words, your deeds and your desires, it's true. What the Bible says, that there is no one righteous, no, not one, it's true as we sit here. For every one of us, there's a recognition that there is sin within us and that we fall short of the glory of God. This is what makes those destructive words so incredibly painful and powerful. Because when we hear those words, there's a part of us that says, yeah, but what if it's true? I haven't been the best. I have messed up here. I have those desires I know that are wrong. And so as you see the three crucified, you begin to realize the perfect innocence is perplexing, not only because he's on the cross, but everyone sins. Everybody does it. We're all kind of like the two criminals. But we're forced, as we see those three crosses, to see the great contrast between the crucified Because as we see the crucified, the cross speaks to us and says, you are a sinner. Do you deserve God's judgment? And we don't like it. We don't like to explore that contrast. We don't like to have the word of God speak to us and probe into our inner heart and tell us that our thoughts, words, deeds, and desires all come uh, under the condemnation of God because they do not live, uh, do not follow perfectly the will of God. We don't like that. And so that's another reason why we say, no thanks, I don't want to spend time looking here. Let me go look at other things, positive things, good things, things that build me up and encourage me because this is confusing and yet 
the word of God says, no, 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 don't stop looking. There's more that you have to see. There's more that you have to see. So I want to ask you, not only do you see Jesus Christ crucified, but do you see Christ crucified among criminals? And do you recognize that they deserve it and yet Jesus is perfectly innocent? What's going on? Why is Jesus on the cross? Why did nobody stop it? Why did nobody defend him? Why did even his closest friends run? Why did his closest friend deny that he even knew him? Well, this prepares us for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a curse. There's a curse for those who are crucified. And what is the curse that's carried on the cross? Well, Paul, he writes in Galatians 3, verse 13, here's why the cross of Christ was publicly portrayed as, uh, why Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified before your eyes. Why I kept showing you this image. Here's why I kept showing you this image. Not to tear you down and to uh, destroy you. No, it, it speaks to the, your reality, your reality of sin and death and the judgment you deserve. It speaks to that reality, but the reason it's portrayed for you is because God was doing a wonderful thing. Why was he there, though innocent? Why was Jesus cursed by men and God? Christ, says God through the Apostle Paul, Christ redeemed you from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Why was Jesus there? Why did the Apostle Paul publicly portray Christ as crucified? Why are we called uh, to see the cross? Because Jesus Christ became a curse for us. Christ hung on the cross for you. He hung there in your place. He experienced that pain the physical pain, the emotional shame and destruction and, and, and destroying and the spiritual curse for you so that you won't ever have to be there. So that you, though people may try to put you there so that you may know that God will never put you there. You are loved by God that you are blessed by God, that you are not under the curse of God. Why? Because Jesus Christ took that curse upon himself. Jesus was cursed by God so that when the light of judgment day exposes your every thought, word, deed, and desire, you won't have to, as, as Luke says in, in Revelation 16, uh, 6 or 16 says, you won't have to run to the mountains and to the rocks and say, oh, it's finally all out. Cover me, hide me. I don't want this reality of who I've been to come out. He was there so that on that light of judgment day, you can stand and say, my sin and the curse that my sin deserves, it's gone. <laughs> that was taken care of. That was taken care of on the cross of Golgotha outside of Jerusalem. All of that was taken care of. My sin of my past, the things I struggle with in my present, even the failures that may happen in the future. And so help me God, they may not, but... I don't have to live in fear of that. I don't have to live in fear of that all being exposed and for me to be the object of God's wrath and humanity's despisement. Three crucified, two deserved it. The crucified Jesus in the middle of did not. Why was he there? Well, in some sense, you could say, well, that cross should have been empty waiting for the one who deserved it. But rather than it standing empty for you 
as you see it, it's not empty. Christ is there. It's not empty waiting for you. It's there with Christ on it, speaking to you. Forgiven. I've taken it all. And what's the consequence as we come to the final point? Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He redeemed us. He paid the price. He paid the price with his precious blood so that we might go free. He did this because he loves you. In the very center of his heart, he has great compassion for sinners and he speaks to you and he says, I know you through and through. And yet God shows his love to you in this, that I will take your place. I will buy you with my precious blood. I will give up my body so that your body may live. Redeemed, saved. No longer defined. Defined by your thoughts, words, and deeds, and desires. You're no longer defined by your sinful actions. You're no longer defined by the body of evidence that you've come and, and, and lived. No, you are defined by who Jesus is and who he says you are. You're not defined by what other people might call you. By how they might speak about you the words they might use in trying to tear your worth down. You are defined by the words of God that speaks of your worth that was bought by the infinite precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's why we're called to see the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, there is sorrow and there's pain as we see it and as it speaks to our sin but what streams from that reality is that it's not empty but the innocent Jesus Christ is on the cross and he speaks to you forgiven you are loved by God believe it hold the cross before your eyes May God hold that cross before your eyes. Why? Because it's so easy to be bewitched by other images. The Galatians saw something else. And it bewitched them. If you read through the story of the Galatian church, it seems like they saw the glimmers of human potential, the lie of human power, the response that says, other people are tearing me down, but I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm better than that. They just don't know me fully. I can keep God's law. I can walk faithfully before him. I will prove them and God wrong. I am worthy. Not because of who Jesus Christ says I am, but because of who I think I am. That's bewitching to see those glimmers of human potential. Do we really, do you really think that you can change yourself, that you can become perfect on your own? That if you work hard enough, then one day you won't deserve God's judgment? You can't. And Jesus knows you through and through and he sees you better than you see yourself and he says, look at me. You think I'd be here if you could? You think this is great? No, look at me. I'm doing this because I know you and I know you can't, but I love you. And I am here so that you might be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But don't be bewitched. Whoever does not believe is condemned, stands under that curse. If you don't want to see Christ on the cross, <laughs> there is emptiness with a curse that still falls upon you. And so, beloved, as we conclude, there is one image 
that you should hold and that God will hold by his grace before your eyes. It's the cross of Christ. It's the cross of Christ. It's the cross of Christ as specifically described in the Gospels, but it's also the cross of Christ as seen throughout Scripture. Like as you go from here, don't think that you have to read the crucifixion account every single day. Maybe it's a good practice on Good Friday to read all four crucifixion accounts. But you can see the cross of Christ throughout Scripture as you're in the Word of God. You can see the cross of Christ as you read the law and then the curses and the blessings. And then you think, oh, these curses spoken of here carried by Christ. You can see the cross of Christ when you read about all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament that have to be made. A lamb that has to be brought. And you can say, ah, these sacrifices. Yeah, but Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. You can see the cross of Christ as you read about judgment coming to the unfaithful and yet God preserving a remnant. And you see that God saves, not because he thinks, oh, these people are finally going to change. No, he saves because of the cross of Christ. And so, beloved, see Jesus on the cross. See Jesus on the cross. See the pain and the shame of the cross. See the contrast among the crucified on the cross. See the curse that's carried on the cross out of love for you. And then the redemption that gives you eternal life. See Jesus crucified. Amen. Let's sing in response how deep the Father's love for us. And if you need the music for it, you can find it on page 8485 of your Coilbound book.
Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your great love to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you gave yourself to us in him. And Father, as we see the cross, we confess that it is hard for our proud and arrogant hearts to truly abandon our life. We confess that our eyes are so easily bewitched by human possibility and human power, by the things that we can do. We confess that we so easily want to build our identity upon our steps to success. We confess, Lord, that for some it's easy to say, yes, there's problems. But we confess that apart from your grace, it's impossible to say, I'm hopeless and helpless. And so we thank you for the cross, how that makes it so clear to our eyes. We pray, Father, that your spirit will help us to see the depth of our sin and our misery and what it deserves, and that we will flee our own life, that we will not try to preserve our own life and so lose it, but rather that we will flee to the cross of Jesus Christ, and that our comfort and our confidence for life and living will not be resting on our identity, but rather our belonging, our belonging to Jesus, that he has bought us, he has loved us, he has made a wretch his treasure. And so we pray that we might be set free from all the power of evil, the power of destructive forces that try to cause pain, that persecute Christians, that try to say, if you live in this way, you're worthless and you only deserve hurt. We pray that our comfort and confidence in time of pain and persecution will rest on the truth that we belong to Jesus. And also when words, destructive words, are used against us, words of worthlessness or loser, that our identity, our comfort and our confidence might not rest on our identity, but on who Jesus says we are. We pray that we may know ourselves forgiven completely and deeply loved. That we may know that you have given us a new life and a new purpose and a new identity. We pray that that joyful confidence and freedom might change how we live. We pray that we as a church here in Richmond Hill may live holding the cross before our eyes always, reminding us of who we are, what you've done, and then living in the joy of new life as we anticipate the resurrection of the life. Why? Because we know, we know already that we can celebrate resurrection. You have shown it to us in your word, and we live in the age of the resurrected. And so we pray that we will live as new creations and that your spirit will change and transform us. And Father, we pray this morning for those who are suffering, uh, those who are experiencing um, the remnants of uh, this cursed existence, the frailty of the body, sickness and disease, perhaps even facing death. We pray there too that you will enable them to walk by faith, not by sight, knowing that Jesus Christ has conquered all. And we pray, Father, for those who are still held in the grip of powerful images uh, that seek to destroy their life. We pray, Father, that you will break the power of those images and that you will hold before their eyes the cross and the empty tomb and the resurrected life. Show them Jesus in all of his glory. And Father, we pray then that as we gather, that we truly will gather 
not because we're still searching or looking or needing, but that we will gather because we are filled with joy. We will gather to declare, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And that we will gather in that joy and also encourage each other in that joy. Because we know who you have said we are. And we thank you that you give us the grace of the sacraments to affirm that to us. That it's not only words that you speak to us, but Jesus, you've given us baptism. That pictures it for us and then also affirms it to us personally that yes, you belong. So may we hold and cling to that reality of baptism even when uh, the devil, the world, or even our own heart and mind might try to tell us different. We thank you also for the Lord's Supper that we can celebrate that pictures and publicly portrays Jesus Christ as crucified in a tangible way that we can taste and we can see and that we can eat. And we pray that when we see the bread broken as we see the blood poured out, the wine poured out, that we may remember again what Jesus has done for us and live in the joy of that salvation. And Lord, bless us uh, this day. May we rejoice in what was done in the cross of Jesus Christ and bring us back together um, in two days on Sunday as we celebrate early on the morning, the third day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the declaration to the world that Christ is conquered and that there are children of glory that have been bought by his blood. So may we live in that truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You now have the opportunity to bring your gifts before the Lord. The offering uh, this morning is for an organization called Life Renewal. Uh, they uh, run uh, regular programs uh, where facilitators walk with you in learning to apply this gospel of Jesus Christ to your specific life, uh, recognizing that many of us go through difficult periods of um, pain and suffering and sorrow impacted by various forms of um, life's challenges and so life renewal simply seeks to take the gospel and work and apply it to your life and so the offerings collected uh, for that and then we will sing as a closing uh, psalm of praise psalm 16 uh, stanzas 4 and 5 uh, just recognizing that as Jesus Christ died and was buried um, already in the Old Testament there was a recognition and that God will not leave his faithful one in the grave, but will bring everlasting pleasure. And so we'll end our um, service this morning anticipating that resurrection. Psalm 16, 4 and 5, after the offerings collected.
receive the blessing of God and go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I like thought about a halfway through and I was like, well, I guess we're leaving that now. Oh well. I could hear everyone. I don't know, but. Should I return this? No. I don't know where I went. I'm actually surprised.